This is a test video for an overview of the game of Baton Rouge by Richard Berg. Um, it's, uh, it's my first ever attempt of anything of this kind, so please forgive the rough and ready nature of the thing. Uh, why am I doing it? Um, because uh, A, I was inspired by Callendale's videos of uh, uh, game reviews and, and playthroughs, something I enjoyed very much as a mainly solitaire game in my sub, because I, I miss that kind of involvement with other gamers, and you get a vicarious sense of that involvement um, through uh, watching a virtual gamer playing their game. Um, but particularly I'm doing it now because I was given uh, this game by a very kind gentleman who replaced um, a game which he had sent to me in the post, uh, which went missing. Um, I live in Italy at the moment, and although I've had many uh, games and books coming to me through the post, um, in Italy, I've had many coming through fine, but this was the first loss that I had. And uh, he hadn't, he had actually donated, he'd given, it was part of a, a chain of generosity. And he'd, uh, um, so he had given away a game to me. It didn't arrive. He sent me a, a copy of the same game. He happened to have two copies of it. And he sent this as a bonus. So, I've been thinking about doing uh, some game videos for a while, and this really pushed me towards making an attempt as a kind of thank you indirectly back to him via the community by me uh, contributing something like this. Uh, so I'm, I'm reviewing the game of Baton Rouge, that was the bonus game he sent me, and that's that's a good reason to do it, but the other good reason to do it is I think it's actually a great game. I have played it once, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, there's large caveats to that though, the main one being it took me 12 hours uh, in uh, stretched over a number of evenings um, to play the whole game. I completed all 21 turns uh, as a solo gamer, so I'm playing both sides, which does take longer because you're thinking for both sides, um, but uh, it's a long game for essentially quite a sort of small treatment. Uh, you can see the size of this map is, is four times A4. There's not tons of units, it's a tactical game. We've got a Union Brigade, um, which has a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven regiments defending Baton Rouge against uh, two divisions of uh, Confederate attackers and some detached, uh, deta uh, detached units, including um, some partisan ranger cavalry. Now, um, yes, my production of this will not be great. I have a, a fixed, I'm using my mobile phone at the moment to record this because uh, the camera which uh, I was hoping to use for this kind of thing is not working. So. Mobile phone is not so easy, I find, to zoom in and out. Um, and also, this being my first attempt at this, I decided to have a static presentation to start with. I'm sorry that's going to be a bit boring for you, but perhaps at least the voiceover will give some interest. But it does give you a chance to study a map, which you might not uh, look much at before. Um, so anyway, this is just a chart. Maybe no one's going to look at it and... Uh, that will be a good thing. <laughs> I will be getting away with whatever I do. Um, so, uh, that's why I'm covering this game. And who am I? I'm uh, a, mainly a war gamer. Um, it's war games that I enjoy. I used to be a role player before that. When I was young, I played uh, with our toy soldiers against my brother with a you know, mini figs, uh, Donald Featherstone type rules. I didn't get into war games because essentially I didn't have a lot of pocket money and I could never afford them. Um, I only came into them with the birth of eBay and uh, me having some adult spending capacity and uh, uh, the eBay facility to, to get 
to sort of delve into those things that I never had a chance to in my youth. I don't have a lot of time to do things like this. I have a young son and we're moving house soon. I don't know when I can snatch the time to make these videos. So if I ever do make more, they will be few and far between, but I, I do hope to do some because um, I think I'm going to enjoy it and uh, maybe some others would too. Uh, okay, so um, what I intend to do in this uh, video is first talk about uh, some comparisons between this game and others within its family. Then I will talk about the fight itself, and uh, then I will talk about the rules for Baton Rouge, the particularities of this rule set for this game. Uh, so first off, the comparisons. I uh, this game comes from the family of the great battles of the American Civil War. I call it a family, even though I've seen it listed as a series before, be because, although I only have three games from, from this family, um, they have some huge differences between them. So my understanding of a series game is one where if you know the rules for one game, you pretty much know them for the next game, there will be some uh, battle-specific um, rules, but basically you can port your knowledge from one game to the next with minor um, adjustments. But m my experience of Stonewall, this game Baton Rouge, and Three Days at Gettysburg is uh, of some large differences. Perhaps the main difference is difference is that Stonewall, which I understand is the second game after the grandfather, Terrible Swift Sword, has a, a, a standard sequence of play whereby one side takes all their moves and fires and rallies, etc. Then the other side takes all their moves, rallies, fires, etc. Not so in Three Days at Gettysburg. In Three Days at Gettysburg, you basically have a chip pull mechanism, and each chip activates a division, of, so a number of uh, brigades can possibly move and fire and perform a few actions at the same time. This game, on the other hand, has something that uh, Richard Burke called the turn continuation table. I understand it's much maligned, and I understand why, because what it basically does is it breaks everything down into very small fragments. So, um, uh, and things are done by brigades, so it's not the whole force on the board, it's not a division size of the force on the board, but it's a brigade sized force that you're dealing with at any one moment. And that force can do either or, 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 or. So it can either move, or fight, or rally, or um, resupply, etc, etc. So, essentially what happens is you roll a die, depending on certain factors, it's either the brigade you indicated as wanting to activate, activates, or your opponent gets an reactivation and then they are in charge of the die and they roll and it goes back and forth like that. On the roll of seven on that die there's a random event so obviously those are quite common, they interrupt play action. But the point is is that say you want this brigade to move, if you manage to activate him, okay he moves, then you might want him to fire, you have to roll again on the turn continuation table. That your fire might be interrupted, your, your opponent may get a roll, and they may do something, they may do several things, different brigades doing different things, uh, before you get back and that brigade fires. By that time, you might not want that brigade to fire, you might want someone else to respond to something your opponent did. So you see, things fluctuate and move very fluidly. However, I say it's fluid in that the action, if from an overall viewpoint, flows from this unit to that, to this, to that, across sides. But it's very bitty in the sense that you can't do everything for that brigade necessary for that turn, then they are finished. And then you move on to the next brigade, then they are finished. No, you, you will keep coming back to brigades. 
it makes it interesting, it makes it exciting, but it takes a long time to uh, resolve everything. In other respects, those the three games are similar. They all involve ammunition supply at this tactical level. That seems appropriate. Um, they all involve uh, zones of control that are not sticky, but um, allow you to shoot at enemies moving through them. Um, they all involve brigade combat effectiveness, so as um, individual units in that brigade take losses, the whole brigade can suffer in its combat effectiveness. Um, in, in that way, you, you find that you don't batter down a single unit completely because, um, well you could, and um, keep your other units completely free, but generally losses get spread throughout um, uh, units and brigades because you, you, you don't want to uh, need something completely. Uh, anyway, okay, I'm not explaining that very well. Um, what else do we have in terms of comparison between the three games? Uh, well, the last thing is perhaps the turn time, the hex size, and the what strength points represent. Now this is quite interesting because um, Stonewall has a turn lasting 20 minutes. I guess that's the same as Terrible Swift Sword. Um, I don't remember what three days of Gettysburg, what their turn represents. It might be an hour. I think it's an hour. It might be half an hour. I can't remember. Um, in this game a turn represents 45 minutes. So it's a little bit more than twice as long as Stonewall, but what you find is that uh, the same unit could move two, maybe three, maybe even four times in one turn. So a unit can probably do more if it wants to within the same time frame as a unit in Stonewall, but it will suffer fatigue and eventual exhaustion from doing so. Um, the hex size for this game is 110 yards across. In both Stonewall and Three Days at Gettysburg, it's 125 yards across. A small chain, I guess it was felt appropriate for this action. I don't know if other great battles of America similar in their games have the same yardage. Um, but perhaps a, but a, 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 another difference is that the, the um, uh, strength points in Stonewall the older game, the strength points equaled 100 men or one gun. In three days of Gettysburg, the, a strength point equals 50 men or one gun. And in this game, it equals 25 men or one gun. So you'll see that you have um, a unit such as these partisan rangers that have one, two, three, four, five, eight, eight strength points. Can you see that? Um, eight strength points, uh, what does that equate to? That's 200 men. So, in one of the other games, that would be uh, 800 men or, or 400 men. You see quite a big difference. This is a sm kind of like a smaller game, a bit, a game, a bit more focused in. It's a smaller fight. You have 2,500 men on the Confederate side, side and uh, I think maybe about 3,000 on the Federal side. Okay, I think that's enough about comparison of the three games from the family or series, if you like. Now um, I'll talk about the fight because I think it's a very interesting fight. Um, as the uh, rules state, it was a, it's a game of the Confederate attempt to retake the capital of Louisiana and its Union. Arsenal. Now these are the breastworks surrounding the Arsenal. And the, uh, the Arsenal itself, I think, of these three hexes, and then there's uh, garrison buildings. Um, the uh, Confederates want to take their capital back, Louis, uh, their capital of Louisiana back. So uh, one of their victory objectives is the State House here. Their other main victory objective is necessarily the arsenal there because 
obviously if they had the city without uh, and the union still had their encampment and their whole arsenal here they're not in a very safe position so they gain a complete victory by capturing both these areas they can gain a partial victory by capturing just the arsenal they don't gain a partial victory by just capturing the state house except they can get what's called a tactical victory if they manage to push back the Union beyond this road line, this way. So if there's no Union units east of that, they win a tactical victory. Or if they have inflicted 50% casualties on the Union side and less than that themselves, they win a tactical victory. So in case of a tactical victory, you would basically understand the day ended, the fight had not been resolved and we would presume it would continue the next day unless one side or the other retreated. Um, otherwise the confederate need to get here and to get here as well gives them complete control of their objectives. The federals are trying to stop them doing that. Now, um, okay, so far so good, so ordinary, but what makes this game um, so interesting to me is all of the colour in it. Um, the first thing perhaps to mention is uh, the fact that it is it involves boats. Look here is a confederate ironclad on fire. Apparently that's not a very accurate picture because there's another picture of the same ironclad looking completely different somewhere else in the magazine. But uh, needless to say, sometimes people do paint it from more or less from their imagination or approximation. Uh, anyway, can't find it um, no, uh, Ah, here we go. That is the, fed, the, the Confederate ironclad Arkansas. She had a short-lived life, but she was a very powerful boat. The main deficit was her uh, engine failure. Now, the Confederates have this ship as a unit in the game. The Federals have a few more. They have one ironclad, the Essex. And then they have some uh, gunboats. Now, um, the uh, Essex is not a match for the Arkansas, neither are any of the gunboats. They're a lot weaker. The Essex is not too much weaker, but um, the uh, um, what am I going to say? Yeah, so you have this basic fight with the, the uh, Confederates moving and trying to take the capital. The capital is guarded by these boats somewhere in the Mississippi River nearby. And the Arkansas comes steaming down from this direction to engage them. The point being that um, if, say, the Confederates did manage to get to the arsenal, wiping away um, or wiping out of the way the, the uh, Union forces, the Union gunboats could just pile that artillery fire in into them from the river, making their position untenable. So they need the Arkansas to um, remove that threat from the action. Uh, the next point of colour in this game is that uh, it lasts from 4am in the morning till 7 at night. It's uh, August the 5th, 1862. It's going to be a hot day, and uh, from 11.30 onwards, units can suffer from the heat. This means that, you know I said earlier, they might be able to move more than twice a turn. It's going to get harder to recover from that if they do so. And they will suffer more penalties during the heat in the second half of the game. But apart from that, there's also... A fog in the first four turns of the game. So in that early morning mist, uh, well in fact fog, the Confederates launched their surprise attack. 
it has its benefits. They can get nice and close without uh, the Union art artillery being able to make a pop at them. But the disadvantage is that it's very easy for them to wander off their tracks unless they are following a road. So uh, the Confederates, you can see, it, come in on, there's a division here and a division here. Um, they come in from this side of the board, from the east, and unless they follow the roads, they're going to wiggle a bit and they might not coordinate their advance as would be liked. The fog also cuts down visibility to, I think, two hexes and effective fire to only one hex um, in those first four turns. So you can see that sets a, that, that those first four turns have a very different flavour for the rest of the, the rest of the game. The, uh, it's it's basically the, the advance of the Confederates and you see where they get to before the um, Union can respond. The Union cannot respond in that time unless their pickets are activated. Um, there's rules for, for, for that. Once the, some pickets are activated, then, then all of the rules uh, come to start moving. Um, so that's the basic overall of the fight. Uh, here you have a detachment with some artillery, Confederate detachment. They're obviously meant to come down here. Um, as I said, a division amassed somewhere north of this road and another division between these two roads here. Uh, sensibly, that seems to tell us that Ruggles' division is heading towards the State House and Helm's division is heading towards the Arsenal. This detachment is uh, detached. <laughs> what do you do then? And what do you do with the partisan rangers? Of course, that's up to you. What 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 happened in, in my game was that we found in my prior game was that we found uh, these units uh, got stuck around here for a while. These units moved in here and uh, basically pushed a federal line back to about here, capturing lots of artillery in the process. Uh, captured artillery cannot be used by the opposing side, but. Um, and in fact, they, they, it remains where it is. The artillerymen often run away, so the artillerymen can run back and uh, pick up their artillery. And that, that happened to a couple of guns that hit in my prior game. Um, and I, I had, uh, in fact, I had the partisan rangers here and uh, Shields detachment and this cannon coming through here. They, they worked their way around here, and the partisan rangers tried to bother this group. Um, which are, they're essentially locked in place for, I can't remember when, but a longer period of time than these guys are. Um, so, uh, yes, it, the, my prior game actually ended up in a Confederate win. They, the, these ones swept up here, pushing the um, Federals back to the beach. And uh, these ones um, came in from this direction into the arsenal um, through these two roads, which uh, passed through the breastworks. Uh, and the Arkansas itself sank, but not before driving off two of the uh, gunboats from the field for, for a while and uh, causing some damage to two others. But what I actually found was that although these are a threat, and in the long term they would be a threat, the, uh, the guns on these boats are, are weak enough as such that essentially they are rolling on a very low uh, combat uh, odds. Um, no, it's not odds, is it? It's um, strength points. So at the um, they, they're, they're not going to do a lot of damage in the short term or cause a great threat in the short term unless they're very lucky. Um, and uh, my game ha hastened to an end as, as we went on because, some, because of the random events, sometimes 
uh, a very short um, and uh, some terms are even skipped because of heating, general heat exhaustion, there's like a lull in the fighting. Um, so we have the, uh, the fog, heat, um, the boats, and then we have the urban combat. This game has um, rules for urban hexes. You see these white areas are partially urbanized. Uh, they're, they're called partial blocks. So it's a block of houses, partially urbanized. And these um, sort of maroon colored ones are fully urban hexes. What this means in rules particular to this game is that uh, units can occupy a block rather than a hex of which the block is a, which make up a part of the block. So um, how to explain that, if you are travelling down, down this road here, uh, you would move normally like this, this hex, this hex, this hex, this hex, this hex, this hex, this hex like that. That designates you moving down the road. Um, if you're in column, you're down the road. If you're in line, you would be counted as moving in the other terrain in the hex. If, if say, you're in this hex on the road, or in fact, just outside it in the near area there, and you want to move into the block, then through various um, functions, you place your counter somewhere in the block. It doesn't matter where, because essentially, any unit in the block is adjacent to all the roads around it, but two equivalent two hexes away from the next block across the road from it. Um, what are the advantages of doing that? Well, one thing is, is that, um, that you get great protection in the um, these, um, urban blocks. Uh, you're less likely. I can't remember, but anyway, it's harder to dislodge people in them. But the disadvantage is that because you're considered to have all round facing in the block, you only get um, a maximum of three strength points firing out at any one other hex. So you distribute your men over a greater area, but you make them harder to dislodge. You can do the same in the partial blocks, but it just does not provide as much protection. Okay, so um, we describe basically what's going on here. You, you can see the, there's only two levels of terrain. This is a lower level, and we've got basically a clear level. We've got woods, the fire here, which uh, artillery cannot cross. And you can see these, some of the roads do not cross bayou or the streams. The streams cross them, so you actually have to wade through the water even though the road runs up to it. Which, interestingly enough, means that the artillery, which there's two batteries placed here, they, they cannot cross the bayou, they cannot cross even where the ford is here, or the, where the road leads to here, to go back into, for example, the uh, federal arsenal. So I found that these batteries are basically stuck on this side of the bay the whole game because it costs a um, it costs a, an activation to change formation to limber them. It costs an activation to move them. They, they don't get to move very far over these streams. Then they have to go downhill. They have to go over another stream. Then they have to go uphill. That would take so many activations. I found that I was needing those activations elsewhere because you want to take you want to be careful with your activations because you're not guaranteed to move every unit in the turn so you have to prioritize and that as I said before that priority priority will fluctuate as the, depending on your enemy's um, activations. So depending on what else happens um, and these guns being unable to cross the bio which ends here, the only way they can get close to the action, if the action is in fact remaining around here, is to come this way round. 
And in fact, that became untenable in my game because by that time, by the time they were released, because as I said, they're frozen in place for some number of time. By the time they were released, um, the Confederates' advanced uh, units were already around here. So there would be no, not much chance of training some artillery along. So that, that is an interesting part of the fight, that these, these, uh, this artillery could provide covering fire for the arsenal here and for any advance across this relatively open stretch. Um, but artillery cannot fire through the blocks. They can fire over, but uh, that is generally very ineffective. Because it's, it's plunging fire and it's unobserved. Um, what else to say about the fight? Well, I don't know. That's about it. These these guys are all in camps. I don't know if you can see. I won't zoom in because I'll mess my setup here. But there's some uh, tents drawn on the, um, the map, and these guys are camped there. So the federal units are pretty much in place. You can sort of place them, some of them within one or two hexes, and the Confederate units have to come in, in, in within their designated areas, you can choose where the partisan rangers come along. They're an interesting unit because they are armed with shotguns, so up close they are extremely powerful, but uh, they're also very fragile in, in their morale in, in the sense that they are easily spooked at some random event, spook them, and um, uh, 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 they, they, they're kind of jittery. What I found in my game was that they, they, um, their morale is very low. It's two compared with a lot of the Federals have a morale of five, which is good. You're rolling on a, a D6, um, trying to get lower than that to sort of remain undisrupted or unrouted. Um, often uh, they are, are fleeing, but then they they can come back on an activation, they can rally themselves, they don't need a commander to rally themselves, so they, <laughs> they come go back and forward a bit in a kind of jittery motion. Uh, yes, yeah, so the uh, Confederates are generally better units than the Federals, but um, the Federals generally have a, a morale of four, five for the artillery, some three and some two. Um, what to say, maybe just something about the components. I've put great blobs of white on these two fellows because this is the federal overall commander and this is the um, federal overall commander. And without those distinguishing marks it's hard to notice who they are and they have a, they're able to give uh, some command bonuses to their subordinates. Now, I think that in printing this game, there is some kind of cock up in the printing because you can see this is a federal commander, very clear white on dark blue, but that's actually a replacement commander. The original commander is here, printed on black on dark blue. Can you see it? I've considered uh, completely adjusting these originally painting over there with white and then rewriting them. I might yet do that, but I don't know, I'll get around to it for this game. Uh, the um, Confederate ones are, 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 are a lot clearer. The commanders are in this kind of orange and the um, units are in grey. Sorry about not zooming in. I should get onto that in any future videos. Um, but so nice, nice pictures. And, uh, what you have listed on the units is um, there. This is the uh, 7th Vermont Battalion B. 
of the Vermont, uh, 7th Vermont Regiment of uh, the uh, Brigadier General Thomas Williams Command. Um, the AR indicates the uh, army rifles that they're using, and there are five strength points of men there, so what's that? That's 125 men, and their morale is hungry. Okay, I think that's enough about the battle. Um, I didn't mention that these are orchards and this is a graveyard. Here we have a penitentiary with a very, very high walls. It's, it's empty apparently, and that cannot be entered. So uh, that creates an interesting kind of split between these two portions that were already naturally there of, of the city and um, of the capital. And uh, that, that kind of effect, plus the two divisions of the Confederates and their axes of advance generally dictate the effect of the action. I wonder, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the unions are spread out around here. It, at first, I thought in my previous game that both of these divi Confederate divisions would kind of deal with this section and then move on to that section once they had decimated these. Uh, I have taken forces in detail. It didn't work out that way because um, so these were released at a certain point. They came to reinforce uh, basically some of these moved back uh, with a reinforcement from here and defended the R's and all some forward points. And these fight for a rearguard action all the way back to the beach and were pretty much decimated by the end of the game. Um, uh, I think there's, I mean, I say decimated, uh, most units still had a lot of fighting capacity. Um, two federal commanders have been wounded and uh, replaced, and one confederate. And I think one uh, confederate, each div confederate division has two brigades, two confederate brigades in it. Um, and one brigade had been rendered combat ineffective, and two or three had been, of the Federals had been rendered combat ineffective. Anyway, enough of that, Blather. Let's have a look at Baton Rouge rules itself. You have a lot of charts. Uh, this is my photocopy of the charts that came out of the. Uh, center of the magazine, uh, you have charts in here, but um, you can't just take the charts out without removing some of the rules, so I, I photocopied the charts and have a funny join there. Um, I've put some notes on it. I also have some notes about the city blocks there because um, you can't see them just off the, the camera there because there's a lot of detail in this game, a lot of colour that um, it's difficult to remember. What you have here are terrain effects on movement, uh, terrain effects on combat, stacking restrictions, formation stacking prohibitions, so can infantry stack with mounted cavalry in line or with mounted cavalry in column. You have density adjustments, so the density of the units will affect fire upon them. Um, this is the turn continuation table and this is the action chart. These are all the actions that may be performed by in-command um, units, uncommanded units and these are just administrative actions such as rally, field promotion, resupply and the naval segment. Uh, that's one side. On the other side, you have the assault results table, you have the fire combat table, and, uh, and you have the morale table. Then you have a 
summary of the Amelia initiation procedure and uh, the notes, the tables there. So there's quite a lot of tables there. There's a few more. Um, you have the leader casualty table, and then these are all uh, these three are, are tables for the ships, and this is the picket detection table. So this will determine how and when uh, the Confederates are detected within that fog, and uh, determining when the, all the, the union of units will start to be activated. Um, so what to say? There's quite a lot to say about this. Uh, if we, I thought I'd just go through the, um, uh, the book as we take it. So, uh, okay, actions and reactions depending on the uh, tone continuation table. As you can see, there are lots of actions. Um, but it, it's broken down. So. Artillery wagon movement has a different activation than leader movement for them. Um, infantry movement. Um, so movement is straightforward except for um, moving in and out of those city blocks. Um, got formations in line or um, column formation for the infantry and the cavalry. The artillery can be linked or unlimited. And in this game, the uh, infantry also have a modified line formation, which um, I understand is will be a kind of like a, maybe a half column, half line, because it, it presents less strength points for fire, but it enables them to move through these um, partial blocks uh, in a in a in a, in a modified line formation, so they're not in column, but they're not in a in a full line. So um, a full line cannot move through the urban environment. But the stacking fire combat, they uh, fire combat is interesting. Um, I guess to do with the uh, intricacies of turn continuation. When you fire on someone, they can immediately fire back on your reaction, not as a, an activation, but just as a reaction. And they could even adjust their facing to meet that. So that makes the battles very interesting, because if you fire on someone, you know they're going to fire back at you. Um, so the fights are not one-sided, although hopefully you've, you've uh, affected them prior to them being able to have much effect upon you. Um, ammunition resupply. You've got cavalry charges here. So there's one cavalry unit in the whole game, and they have a charge. I had a bit of a nitpick about the um, cavalry, because there's quite a few, there's a lot of space taken up for them in the charts. They've got their own little rule section there, but there's only one unit, so the, the amount of uh, um, effect on play that they that they take an inordinate amount of um, of space up on on the uh, charts, which means it takes longer to look things up. Um, the armed cavalry and. Uh, but I thought about it, and on balance, I actually think I would prefer it to be this way, that the cavalry have as much detail as the, um, the infantry. If that one unit was abstracted out, you wouldn't have got the uh, kind of exciting charges and leadbacks that, that I had in my game. Um, they could have been abstracted out quite easily, but it would detract from the overall colour that this particular game provides you with all... all it's different facets. Um, okay, you've got routes, retreats, leadership, combat effectiveness. And now we come to the fatigue and exhaustion rules. So as I told you that this August the 5th day was an extremely hot day. And uh, units that move more than 
twice for a or move or assault more than twice for are assaulted more than twice in one turn will find it harder to will become fatigued and maybe exhausted if you're fatigued uh, um, uh, penalties on I think morale and, and firing and movement and if you're exhausted you yeah, um, can't do pretty much anything and it takes a whole turn, a whole 45 minutes of doing nothing to recover from those effects. So you, it can be risky. You can still react, fire in reaction, but you can't move an assault. So it can be risky to overexert your men, especially in the heat that's there for half the day. Then you have the naval rules. Now, they're quite interesting, quite abstracted, though, and necessarily so, because it would have just add too much extra to the rules to um, make a proper tactical game. Basically, uh, each um, boat has two sides. One side details its um, artillery, and they have their own section here. These are all the different kinds of artillery that are on the various boats. Here's the standard artillery, and here's the small arm. Uh, so the boats can fire as sort of standard artillery, but again, that, that they will often because of the, the buildings being in the way, they'll often be firing plunging shots, unobserved, and so being fairly ineffective unless they're very lucky on their die roll. And the other side, um, so that's for example the Arkansas. Two, two types of guns on board. And the other side lists its RAM capability and its damage points and its fighting value. Now this is the boat to boat combat. So essentially what you would do is you, if the Confederates activate the Arkansas and say, right, the Arkansas is fighting this chap and you roll on the table, and generally what happens is the Arkansas will send that, will cause quite a lot of damage, and that ship will withdraw for a turn. Um, and then they can try and fight back. I didn't get round to ramming. No, I think I did, yeah, I did try a couple of rams, but they're not a, a dead cert, so I didn't have any success, and the Arkansas got sunk for... <laughs> managed to actually destroy any of the uh, federal ships. But I, in my prior game, I was actually lucky the Arkansas arrived because historically it never made it into the actual battle. It, um, is that right? I, I can't remember because there's a bit of detail about it in the magazine. Um, essentially though, it, it um, suffered from engine failure and had to be parked. Um, in a, in a safe spot on the river and uh, eventually scuffled. Um, so yes, it, it did. It, no, I think that was it. It was late because of the engine failure and then it was uh, because of its lack of maneuverability it got trounced by the federal defense. Even though it's quite a bit stronger than any single one of them. Um, so that's uh, so you, you've got that, which is an exciting little kind of sub game. But the, uh, the Arkansas, as I said, might not actually arrive. It depends. You have ch ch within the random events, you, uh, the Confederate player in some random events gets the chance to roll for the Arkansas arrival after a certain time. You might want to delay that because. You might roll and find it's not arriving, that's it, it's got stuck. And then the, confet the, the Union, they know that they're okay, so you might want to delay the Arkansas arrival and to keep them guessing. I was lucky it did arrive. And then it got sunk. Uh, so you have the, uh, the naval rules, and you have the fog of rules for the um, it's, 
I kind of spoke about that, I won't go into that in much detail. Um, you also have rules for union pickets when they wake up and your when uh, Confederate units move adjacent, or anyone with fires, or, or so forth. And then the, the last bit is the random events which range from friendly fire actions, sniper fire actions, so um, leaders being potentially wounded or, or killed, um, possible turns finishing, possible swapping of activations, uh, possible ineffective command of a brigade, i.e. a brigade has finished its action turn. So you can see that there's a lot of colour about a, a basic um, uh, American Civil War combat, for example, the Stonewall game, that's a great game, but this has got so much more um, detail, uh, so much more odd details in it. You've got the fog, you've got the heat, you've got the urban combat, you've got the boats, etc. Um, I think that's enough of uh, an overview of the game. Uh, the setup's quite easy, it doesn't take too long. Um, gameplay takes ages, but uh, like I said, I enjoyed it, and uh, my intention now is to play through another game. Hopefully, it'll be a bit quicker and um, provide some action reports on that game. And uh, we'll take it from there. Okay. That's it for now.